Well, I want to thank you, uh, Adrian, for hosting this, and I want to thank Momentum uh, for asking me to, to be here. And I especially want to thank all of you who are tuning in and, and viewing this. Uh, it's an exceptional opportunity for me to be able to speak from my home. And uh, it's really, uh, it's an amazing thing that we're being able to connect in this way. Uh, the goal that I have uh, in speaking to each of you right now, it's, uh, it's really a simple goal that I have. My goal is not to share ideas with you for inspiration's sake, because inspiration in life usually slips through our fingertips. Inspiration comes and goes. You know, when I want to be inspired, what I do, I put on Josh Groban or Andre Bocelli, and I listen to you raise me up. But inspiration, it comes and goes. It's emotional, it's feelings. I wanna share with each of you a bit of Jewish wisdom. And the goal that I have is that we ultimately can take some of that Jewish wisdom and actually incorporate it into our lives and to make it real and turn it into action. You know, no matter where you're from right now, if you're from LA or Israel, New York, wherever, in between London, I know some people are tuning in, wherever you are, I guarantee each one of us wants the exact same thing in life. Each one of us wants greatness. We all want to be great. We all want to be greater husbands and wives, parents, a vision of what that greatness looks like. But I guarantee another thing that each one of us has a very definite, clear way of how we're going to achieve that greatness, and that is the way that I want to achieve it for myself. Each one of us wants to be in control of our own lives. And we think we're in control all the time. If you're married, believe me, you want to control your spouse. <laughs> if you're a parent, oh, I want my, my child to be independent. You mean inside the parameters that you set. That means we all want to control our kids. If you work in the workplace, you want to control the people you work with, especially the bosses. Oh, I know I can run the company better than them. We all want control of everything in our lives. But do you know what we want control of more than any of those other things? We want to control ourselves. I want to be in control of me. The last thing I want in life is anyone telling me what to do. That's why we want to be rich. You know what money will give me? Power. Power is, I can do whatever I want. We want to be in control. And I think that's what's most difficult about the pandemic that we're facing right now. Because the rug was pulled out from each of us, and we were reminded something, that none of us are in control of anything. We're not in control of anything. And now here we are, stuck in our homes. Think about how we were living our lives right before this pandemic. Think about the control we had. From our iPhones, you want food? Uber Eats. It's at your house in two minutes. Alexa, play me Billy Joel Summer Island Falls. Count to three. Three, two, one. There it is. Billy Joel singing. Everything's at our fingertips. This pandemic hits and it reminds us, you know what? We're not in control. And now here we are, stuck in home. We're stuck up here. We're not in control of anything. But there's one thing we know, guys, and that is this is a window of time. It's a window of time. We know it's not going to last forever. Please, God, it should not last forever. It had a beginning, and it will have an end, and it's a window of time. There's a great movie, Miracle. You know, I work in Hollywood. I love movies. I've spoken about this before. The movie Miracle has a, a line that the real coach Herb Brooks says. It's a true story about the, the Miracle on Ice, the 1980s hockey team. Coach Herb Brooks says <clears throat> to his players right before they go out on the ice, he says, great moments are born from great opportunity." You know what this window of time is right now? It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. It's not a limitation. It's an opportunity. There's another window of time that we're going through right now. It's the window of time from the end of Passover to the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. There's literally a window of time from the last day of Passover when God took the Jewish people out of Egypt and we go to Shavuot. And Shavuot is when God gave the Jewish people the Torah. We literally got freedom, and now we get Torah. And that's a window of time, 49 days. And what do we like during those 49 days? We're supposed to count. We're supposed to count the days. We're supposed to be in anticipation of Shavuot, an amazing thing when God gave the Jewish people Torah. But are we really excited that in a certain amount of days from now, we're going to be receiving the Torah? By the way, Shavuot is not that we sit and we remember, oh, God gave the Jewish people Torah. 
we have to take a moment and think to ourselves, you know what? God is giving me the Torah. God's giving it to me, but do I want it? And we in these days right now where we're really anticipating receiving the Torah again, and are we just counting those days with such anticipation? Think about the things that we get really excited about. You ever go to Amazon and you're tracking your package every day? Oh, <laughs> how many more days till it comes? What are we really excited about? Oh, I'm so excited because in, uh, in a week, you know, Netflix is going to drop another eight episodes of my favorite show. That's what gets me excited. Like, what are the things that really get us excited? For many of us, we have to ask ourselves a question. Why do I need Torah? Because only if we know why we need something will we appreciate receiving it. So from a Jewish perspective, why do we need Torah in our lives? Torah is not just a history book. Torah is a history, and it is our history, but it's not just history, and it's not just great stories. Shakespeare wrote great stories. Torah is so much deeper. The word Torah actually means instructions. It means directions. It's a Hebrew word. It means directions, and it's literally known as Torah Chaim, tools for living, directions for life. The Torah is filled with mitzvahs, Telling us to do this and that. You know, it's not called the uh, 10 suggestions. It's called the 10 commandments. We're commanded to do mitzvahs, actions that we have to do. Who wants that? We want to be in control. We don't want to be obligated. Oh, we just got out of Egypt. Now we're free. And now you're telling me I have to do all these things. But perhaps if we knew the meaning behind some of these mitzvahs, then we would be begging for these mitzvahs. We'd be clinging to these mitzvahs because we know that they're actually tools for helping us live. And you could pick any mitzvah. Pick a mitzvah that you've learned about or that you do and go deep and find the meaning behind it and you'll see that it's something that we can apply to every aspect of our life. You know, one of the first mitzvahs of the day is saying, Modani lefanecha. You know, wake up in the morning, your eyes open up. If you're like me, the first thing you're thinking of is all the things you want to get done today. Your eyes open up, you're like, oh, I got to do this Zoom call, I got to do this meeting, I have this, my kids, my wife, my husband, whatever, all the things I got to get done. <laughs> You know what Judaism says? Hold on. I know you want to be great, and I know you want to change the world, but I'm going to give you one small thing first. Before you get into your control of everything that you want to do today, say the words, and you know what those words are? Thank you. Literally, open your eyes, and the first thing we should be thinking is gratitude. Can you imagine starting your day without the first thing thinking is all the things I want today, but the first thing in our minds is gratitude. Thank you, God, for giving me another day. Can you imagine if our teenagers started their day that way? Things they need today. Imagine they walk up to you and they go, Mom, Dad, before I tell you all the things I want today, thank you. Change their day. Here's Judaism giving us a tool for life, tool for living. You want to have a great day? First start by saying thank you. That's one mitzvah. How about Shabbat? What an amazing idea Shabbat is. That's like a no-brainer. We all want to not work for at least a couple of days every week, right? Shabbat's like, oh, I can't work. You have to rest. Most people think Shabbat is all the things that I can't do. Can't do this, can't do that. What about the things that I can do? You know what I do on Shabbat? I shut off my phone. It is the greatest because I love my phone. I love my iPad. I love my computers, but I shut them off. And my kids know, like on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, daddy gets a text at the, at the table for dinner. We're sitting down having a great dinner. I get a text. I got to get up. It's a work call. I got to go. It's a work call. That's how it pays for all this stuff. I, I got to get up. But Friday night comes. Shabbat comes. Daddy gets a text. I don't even know about it. I shut it off. I turn it off because my kids, they don't just know daddy's home. They know daddy's home. To be able to not just not work, but to be able to take a moment and breathe and get back in touch up here with what my life's about and purpose. There's so many mitzvahs that give us meaning and uh, things that can add to our lives. Even just saying a, a blessing over water. How many times a day are we drinking water? God's like, here's a mitzvah for you. I'm going to give you a gift. Before you drink water, say a blessing. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam shakol niyeh bivaro. Remember Ratatouille, when he eats the food and it's like, he sees all those colors? Say a blessing before you drink water, changes the entire experience. Because before it was just, oh, I'm drinking water because I'm thirsty. 
say a blessing before that water, and all of a sudden, it connects me to purpose, meaning, and to the creator of the world. Each one of these mitzvahs is there to help us in many ways in our life. Even Shabbat candles, look at that. Shabbat candles, there's two candles, you know? Why are there two candles? Because we have to separate from the week. We separate, there's two candles. But at the end of Shabbat, a Havdalah candle, the wicks come back together because we don't live in Shabbat. We take Shabbat, what we learn from it, and we bring it back, intertwined into our week. There's all these different mitzvahs there to help us in life and to help us figure out how we're going to grow and become better. You know, amazing thing. When people die, there's a commandment that we need to stand together in a minion, 10 people, and say Kaddish. There's a commandment. You lose your spouse, child. You have, to, you have to say Kaddish together. Now, right now, it's difficult. Obviously, we're in the pandemic. But when people die, we're commanded to do that. It's an amazing thing. Judaism's like, you've just lost someone so dear to you and close to you. And you might be thinking, you know, I got to go home and I got to grieve alone. I got to be alone with my thoughts. My grief is mine. I, I got to be alone. I got to be on a beach. I got to see the ocean. I got to go to Disney World, happiest place on earth. That's the place I would want to go. God forbid you lose someone close. You go to Disney World. That would cheer you up. And God's like, you know what? No. <laughs> you've just lost someone close to you. You got to sit Shiva. You got to sit for seven days and you got to grieve because through grief, we grow. And then when you say Kaddish, you come back to your community. For a person that just lost someone close to them to be able to stand and say, God, you run the world. That's an amazing thing because your grief, it's not just for you. It literally has a purpose. That's how we turn pain into purpose. There's many mitzvahs. There's many mitzvahs. There's much Jewish wisdom. And it's all in this book right here. It's right here. Wisdom for living, Torah Chaim, tools for living. And while we're in this pandemic right now, we should wake up every day and realize it's a great opportunity for what? To grow. Because we don't always get this opportunity. We're not always stuck at home. We have an opportunity now to grow. And how do we do it? We got to figure out where in my life do I need to work on myself? Let's say I have a problem with anger. I'm yelling at my kids all the time. What does Torah tell me about controlling anger? I want to be a better husband. What does Torah tell me about becoming a better husband? I want to be a better parent. I just want to be better. I want to grow. So what should we do? We should open up the Torah or any Jewish text for that matter and have a, a time once a week, five minutes a week, and watch how Torah, which was written thousands of years ago, is relevant today, right now for exactly what we're going through. And we should sit and learn for five minutes a day. Maybe even five minutes a week would be great and learn Jewish text and we'll see the Torah, it's alive. And as we're in this window of time waiting for Shavuot to the giving of the Torah, we'll realize, man, I need it. I gotta work on myself, I really need it. And once we open up some text and learn some text or Jewish wisdom, there's three levels to understanding Jewish wisdom. The first level is understanding, what does it say? Like literally opening up the book and reading the line and saying, what does this actually say? Let me understand what it says. Oh, Moses did this, he did that. Oh, let me understand. Okay, I see it. If we stop there, it's a tragedy. Number two, take what it says and how does it relate to my life? Take a moment, think about it. Oh, Moses went through this, Abraham, Rachel, Rebecca, whatever you're reading about in the Torah. Oh, I, I can relate to that. I'm a dad, I can relate to that. I'm a parent, I'm a spouse, I can relate to that. Oh, look how they dealt with it. Oh, that's amazing. They grew from that experience. Now comes level three. How do I take what I can relate to and actually apply it to my life? How do I make it real? How do I make it part of me? That's the most difficult part of learning any bit of wisdom is to how do I figure out how to make it real? When was the last time you went to a movie, saw an emotional movie, inspiring movie, and uh, you watch, I don't know, Shawshank Redemption. And the theme of that movie is get busy living or get busy dying. You turn off the movie and you're like, you know what? I'm going to live better. I'm going to appreciate life better. Finding Nemo, one of my favorite movies. When was the last time you saw Finding Nemo, you shut it off and you go, you know what? I'm going to be a better parent. Finding Nemo has a message. It has a theme. You know what the theme is? Be protective of your kids, but don't be overprotective. It's a little too far. How many times do you shut off a movie? You're like, you know what? I'm going to change how I live. That's what Torah is all about. That's what Jewish wisdom is all about. It's literally tools for living. It's how can I apply this to my life to help me grow and to become a better person? Because if we knew the value of these mitzvahs, we'd be clinging to them with everything that we have. 
There's a Jewish word for it. The Hebrew word is devekis. Devekis means to cleave to something, to cling to something. You're in the ocean drowning. Someone throws you a life preserver. You're not going to be like, you know what? Maybe I'll just hold on to that for a minute. That, that might help me out. You know what you do? You hold on to it with everything you have because you know if you let go, you're going to die. What are the things that we cling to in our lives? It's not physical things. It's worthless. It's meaningless. We cling to people that we love. And Jesus says, cling to people that you love and cling to Torah. Because with Torah, we have the possibility of achieving something that is so amazing. You know what it is? Growth. Working on myself. It's the greatest battle we'll ever have in life. The one thing that we want the most control of in life is me. Guess what? Judaism says we have it. We have that control over one thing, ourselves. And when we wake up and realize from a pandemic like this that we're not in control, we realize, you know what? I'm not in control of my life. I'm not in control of my spouse. I'm not in control of my kids, my work people. You know what I'm in control of? Myself. And to wake up at the empowerment and go, wow, I'm in control of myself. I can work on myself. That's an incredible, incredible gift. So as we're in this pandemic, we should take a moment and realize it is a window of time. We should have a goal every day. I want to work on myself, you know? I want to try to become a better person. If there was only a way to do it. If there's only an instruction manual for life to help me become better, there is. It's called Torah. And as we're in this window getting ready for Shavuot, and the Jewish people got the Torah to wake up every day and say to ourselves, why do I need Torah? Because you know what? None of us are perfect. We have a long way to go. And we have the greatest toolbox in history. It's called Torah. And Torah was given in the desert. It was given in the desert for the Jewish people. Why did God take the Jewish people out of Egypt and go, you know, I'm going to bring you to Israel, the land flowing of milk and honey. I'm going to give you the book here. Here's the Torah. God's like, no, I'm going to give it to you in the desert. Because you know what the desert is? The desert is known as no man's land, otherwise known as every man's land. The Torah is for the world. It's really for humanity. So we should wake up every day with clarity that we want to grow and try to see how we can apply Torah to our lives and, uh, and look for inspiration in any wisdom that we can and see how we can turn it into reality. I thank each of you for uh, sharing some moments with me. And I want to thank Momentum, uh, incredible people at Momentum behind the scenes. Uh, it's incredible the investment that they are making for the Jewish community and for the world. And it really has been an honor to be with you guys. I want to give a shout out to all my Momentum guys that we've been to Israel with. Hey guys, if you're watching, uh, when's our next trip? So uh, thank you, Adrian. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. Listen, I, I, do I get to ask you some questions now? Sure, for yeah, q and I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I just want to tell you that your enthusiasm, your passion for learning and growth and your love of Torah wisdom is so infectious. I was just grinning the entire time. But let's get down to some brass tacks here, Mr. Blinkoff, okay? Okay. You talked about gratitude. Okay, so one question is, how do you navigate gratitude, Mr. Blinkoff, when you're climbing the walls of your house and you're on top of all your family members? Gratitude right. as a general direction is a wonderful thing, but how do you access gratitude in a time of potential misery? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, there's a lot of cliches involved in that answer for me. One of them is, you know, glass half full, half empty. Sure. Uh, you know, you don't have to look far to look at the news and see that we're surrounded by death every moment of the day. And I think a great tool is literally looking at the pain that the world is in and feeling grateful that, first of all, maybe we, maybe some of us are experiencing that pain. I'm sure a lot of us are. But as bad as it is, we always know it could be a lot worse. And it's just literally looking at what do I have? You know, specifically for me, though, how do I get through that? When I have four kids jumping, I'm surprised my little one's not here right now jumping on my shoulder. Exactly. It, I'm, I'm really lucky that my wife and I have a great system of handoff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so if I need a break or something, I'll take a walk. I'll go into another room and I hand off to her. And she hands off to me. So that helps a lot. But, um, you know, I can tell you, like, during this time, the kids are clawing and stuff. And I just remind myself, I'm like, you know what? Someday they're going to be, I have four kids under the age of 15. Someday they're going to be grown up and out of the house. And right now, I have them. I have this window of time called parenthood. My son and I have played more chess this week, or actually this month, I should say, than we have in the last two years. And how many little moments has he had? He and I had lemonade outside the other day for five minutes. I'm working at DreamWorks full time. 
we had a four minute football catch. Literally, he's like, Dad, you promised we could play football. I'm like, I got four minutes. I set the timer. Let's go. We go outside. We had a four-minute football catch. And I would have thought, oh, that's crazy. It's so little time. You know what he said to me when I tucked him in? What? He's like, Dad, thanks for the football catch today. To him, it wasn't four minutes. To him, it must have, in his mind, it was like an hour. It was like him and his dad connecting again. <laughs> so it's like looking at these little moments and realizing they are fleeting. They're going to slip through our fingers. Parenthood. If they're all going to be out of the house, talk to your friends that are older where their kids have already left. They would die for their kids to be home, right? So that's what I do. I find little moments I can. And like, look, we're human. We all get a little frustrated at times. Take a breath. Focus on what we have. Focus on the gratitude of what we have, that we're not alone, and that we have an opportunity to connect more with our spouses, more with our kids. And I think we'll end up on top. It's a good answer. You know, I was also thinking as you were speaking, and so were others in the chat function. You know, you talked about Shabbat and the principle of just being home, being home for your kids and yeah. putting your devices. I guess the secondary question is, how do you manage the dichotomy between, say, Hollywood, which is a 24-7 operation? How do you manage to hold such an important position in that city, in that industry, and take 26 hours off a week? What right. I, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's a question I get asked a lot. It's like, how do you balance that? Jewish life with your Hollywood life. And, and you're totally right, Adrian. Uh, and I think you have a history as a, in a creative field as a, I think you were a writer in Hollywood, right? I know you have a history. Um, and so I know you'll relate to this. Um, and people ask me, how do you balance it? I, I go, how could you not embrace the Jewish identity part to help you through it? You know, first of all, I'm very lucky because I work with amazing people who totally respect me. You know, I wear my keep at work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I'm a proud Jew, you know, and uh, I make sure that while I am at work, I'm working hard. Uh, I'm, I'm there 24-6 the rest of the days. So people know if they need me at 1 a.m., you know, that I make sure that, I, that people have the perception that I'm really all in and that I really am working hard as much as I can. So that when I do take off for Shabbat, people understand, hey, he's not taking advantage. He, he really is a hard worker and putting everything in. But I can just tell you how many, th every week, my wife and I, we literally, thank God, we get to shut the phone off. Because as much as we love our devices, we all know sometimes it's just too much. And I need a break. It's such a nice feeling knowing that there's nothing I can do right now on Shabbat to further my career. Right. Just the, taking that pressure off, because as much as success as we have, just to know that, you know what, I can stop right now. I have no goal to further my career. I want to further me. I want to further my relationships. I want to further my clarity to what my life's about. It's, it's, it's such a pleasure. I can't live without it. <laughs> yeah, you're a human being, not a human doing. Okay, there I have another question. This perhaps sure. is going to take you a little off course, but you have to share. You did mention um, Finding Nemo. Can you give us some of the sort of spiritual or wisdom theses of some of the movies that you think are considered wholesome? That's something that a family could watch together love where it. the message furthers what you're talking about. I love that question. That is, I love that you asked that. I've never been asked that question, but I've always wanted to speak about it. <laughs> so, you know, quite often when, um, you know, I didn't grow up ultra religious you know i grew up in a strong jewish conservative traditional home yeah. my parents uh have such a strong love of yiddishkeit and israel and judaism and um it, it was really it was definitely an observant ish home but when i became an adult i had to ask the question of what does judaism mean for me and i had to find my own way and as i started finding religious circles i would be come with around people that'd be like oh i can't watch any disney movies i can't watch any hollywood stuff Really? And I, oh, yeah. And I'm so happy that you asked that question because there is so much Torah, yeah. believe it or not, in film and in story. And I'll give you a couple examples. Good. So since we're talking about Disney, which is most of my career. So um, The Lion King, which was the biggest animated movie of all time when it came out. And it's still such a powerful, so great, right? The music, amazing. It's not a movie about lions. It's a movie about responsibility and greatness. Simba, when he's young, Little Simba, he finds out he's going to be king one day. And his father, Mufasa, says, Simba, there's more to being a king than getting your way all the time. And Simba's like, there's more, <laughs> right? Can't believe it. He thinks being a king means I can do whatever I want. Then something happens to dad. Hopefully anyone watching has seen the movie. If you haven't, spoiler alert, 
Daddy dies. It is a Disney movie. Parents have to die in the beginning. You know how it works. And uh, Simba goes off to Hakuna Matata world. It means no worries. It means no responsibility. Right. And he's off there and he's living large with Timon and Pumba having the time of his life. Midway through the movie, who shows up? Nala, the little girl, the little lioness he used to hang out with. And uh, she's like, Simba, it's good to see you. They sing their song, can you feel the love tonight, right? They're singing their song, rolling yeah. around. They do their little lion kiss. It's a little strange to watch that scene, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And then after they roll around in the grass, they have their scene, they decide maybe we should talk. <laughs> maybe we should talk about what's going on in life. So she says, Simba, you got to come back with me. He's like, where? She's like, you got to come back with me to Pride Rock, where you're from, because Scar's taking over everything. He's like, nah, I'm not going back. I'm staying here. I'm going to Matata World. I, I live in the lap of luxury. She's like, no, no, you don't understand. If you don't come back with me, everyone is going to die, and you are responsible. She literally says the word. Here's the stakes. Everyone's going to die, and you're responsible. And you know what he says then? Akuna Matata. Nah, I I'm not going to do it. And she's like, wait a minute. Where's the guy I was just tossing around with in the grass? When are you going to start manning up, lining up? You know, he goes, you're beginning to sound like my father. She goes, at least one of us does. And you know what she does? She leaves him. She literally walks away from him. But wait, I thought you love him. She gives us a message right there. Our own feelings are secondary to doing the right thing in life. Oh, Saul. Oh, right? you're blowing my mind, Saul. <laughs> about it. And you know what? And there's actually a, a point in Torah. It's uh, when God creates the world and he gives Adam Eve. He says, I'm going to create for you, Adam, an Azer Kenegdo, a helpmate that will go against you. There you go. There's Torah right there in Lion King. Nala goes against him, leaves. Simba's stuck there. He's trying to think about life. Rafiki takes him over to the water. He looks in his reflection. Remember who you are sees his father, goes back and defeats Scar, climbs Pride Rock, and it becomes the biggest animated movie of all time for one reason. It's not about lions. Because when he climbs that rock and that slow motion of the rain and the powerful music, it's about greatness. And greatness, says Lion King, is taking responsibility for the world. Uh -huh. You know where that comes from? Bam. <laughs> Torah.